This week on Animal Miracles, a man in Queens collapses in a busy street, and a dog he never wanted becomes his only hope. Then, a little dog named Barney embarks on an incredible journey to find a family he lost. But first, a young girl is forced to sell her beloved horse. The last thing I remember is the look on her face when the trailer pulled out of the driveway. And I knew then that it was a mistake. Would they ever see each other again? Every young child has a dream, and in our next story, a dream comes true when a young girl gets her first horse. She loves that horse more than anything, but growing up separates them. It would take a miracle for her to find again the love she lost. Growing up in North Carolina, Kim Wren always loved horses. I was one of those little girls that knew the minute they saw a horse that that was what I had to have. I wanted one of those. They were like magical to me, like Pegasus and unicorns and all of that fantasy stuff that, uh, that kids believe in and we sometimes lose when we get grown up. Kim was very young when she decided that she was going to make her dream come true. I started saving my money when I was about 10 years old. I was babysitting and it was 50 cents an hour and it took me about a year and a half, but I saved up $250 and talked my parents into letting me buy a horse. Kim took riding lessons nearby, and the man who owned the stables knew she was looking for a horse of her own. Mr. Grice called one afternoon, and he said that he had found a horse that he really liked a lot, and he wanted to know if I would, wanted to come out to see her that afternoon. And I was really excited, because I had a lot of respect for his opinion. What do you think? She was gorgeous. This is her? She had a really long tail, really long mane, and it was blowing in the breeze. She was just awesome. I couldn't believe that this horse was the one that he had called me about, because I'm just a kid. He, he didn't ask me how much money I had, and he didn't tell me how much he wanted for this horse. I just knew there was no way that, that he could sell me this horse for that, that amount of money. I only have $250. She's all yours. Really? Are you serious? She's all mine? Oh my gosh. Oh, thank you. It was like all the dreams I had when I, was, when I was a little kid about a magic horse. You know, she was just, I thought she was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. But I definitely connected with her the minute I saw her. The horse was named Irish. Soon they were playing games and even sharing a sense of humor. One of her standard things to do was she'd hide behind this teeny tiny little tree. And I was supposed to come down towards her and pretend I didn't see her. Where could you be? And so I'd whistle and I'd call her and I'd look all around. And of course, she's sticking out three feet on either side of this teeny little tree, but she thinks I can't see her. And as soon as I got to the tree, she would jump out from behind this tiny tree, you, you know, and I was supposed to act like I was scared. Oh, Iris! I told her everything. I told her my problems, and I told her my hopes and my dreams, and she was my best friend. They grew up together, and for years they were inseparable. But when Kim turned 19, her focus turned to college and her career. If you're going to college, it's time to grow up. It's time to get a job. To have a job, you need a car. To have a horse, you need a job to pay for your horse. Irish was more than a horse to me, she was my friend. So I felt like selling her was betraying the friendship. But I felt like it was the only thing to do that was fair to her. A man called and was interested in coming to look at Irish and we met him out at the stable and he had a horse trailer with him in case he liked her. Um, and he looked her over and we talked and um, he handed me $250. 
That was awful. Yeah, it really was. The last thing I remember is the look on her face when the trailer pulled out of the driveway. And I knew then that it was, it was a mistake. But I, I couldn't change it. I cried and cried and cried. I knew that Iris and I had a very special relationship, but I didn't realize how special it was until I got older and until she was gone, until I didn't have her anymore. As time passed, um, I became wrapped up in school and, and work and what have you, and I always thought about her from time to time. I always wondered where she was, what had happened to her. Finding Irish again was always a dream, but realistically, I didn't think I'd ever see her again. 23 years passed. Kim married and had a young daughter of her own who rekindled her interest in horses. So one night I got on the internet, it was late, and I was looking to see if there were any horse rescues in North Carolina, and I did a search. And so I brought up the Horse Protection Society of North Carolina. The society takes in and cares for horses that have been abandoned or abused. There was an area on the web that you could meet the horses. And so I thought, oh, well, they'll have some of their horses and their stories. I clicked on the, the third horse named Nightshade, and the picture came up before I even had the chance to realize what I was looking at, um, I busted out crying. I just lost it. And I leaned forward and I looked at the picture and all I could think was there is no way this can't be Irish. What would she be doing in China Grove, North Carolina? And so I read the story and I looked at the picture and I cried. She desperately wanted this to be Irish, but how could it be? Kim emailed the society's executive director, Joan Benson. I was fairly convinced that uh, Nightshade was Irish, in fact. Uh, everything that we had talked about in the emails all matched up. Kim was unbelievably excited, but there was only one way to find out for sure. She drove to the Horse Protection Society in China Grove. I'm hoping this is really gonna be Irish. Well, I hope so too. She's out in the pasture, would you like to go see? And she told me that Nightshade was really not interested in people particularly, so she suggested that I walk out in the pasture very slowly. And she told me that, that Nightshade would not come for anybody unless they had a food bucket in their hand. This was the moment. Could this 33-year-old horse be her beloved Irish? I was really nervous. I walked out into the middle of the, the pasture and Nightshade just never even looked up. And so I got a little bit closer and I called Irish. Irish? And Nightshade threw her head up and looked at me so funny. And I said it again and she walked right up to me. Irish? I looked at her, I knew it was her. And then I started telling myself that there was no way it could be possible. It was too big a miracle. And so I'm standing there and I'm going, this is her legs, this is her feet, this is her mane, this is her face. You know, it was just, it was just incredible. There wasn't a doubt in my mind that was Kim's horse. Not a doubt. Kim couldn't believe her good fortune. She was reunited with her childhood love. Now Kim visits regularly trying to make up for lost time. I told her I was really sorry, and I told her why I had to sell her and um, how much I'd missed her. <laughs> Anytime a horse can find, again, a person that they really loved and respected in their life, that they valued, that's an important turning point. And with Irish, her whole attitude and demeanor changed once Kim stepped back into her life. She started coming to people. She started looking for attention from people. Finding Irish again truly has been a life-changing experience. It's given me something to look forward to, something to be appreciative of, but it's an overwhelming feeling of, why am I being blessed with this miracle? What did I do to deserve being able to find her again? There are not many things in life that bring you the kind of joy that um, finding Irish again brought me.
Coming up next, a father vows never to mourn a pet again. He said, no more pets in my house because I don't want to cry like I did that day. Only a miracle can change his mind. More and more cities are referring to their pet owners as pet guardians. It's an appropriate change because keeping a pet involves a great responsibility. A young boy sent in the next story, which is about his dad. It's a story of changing roles where the guardian becomes the guarded in a moment of mortal danger. When Luis Andrade was a young boy in Guatemala, he had a dog that was unexpectedly killed. He had never felt such pain. And I used to cry like a, if he was my brother dying. And uh, since that day, I said, no more pets in my house. Because I don't want to cry like I did that day. Now Luis lives in Queens, New York, and his own son, Jonathan, wanted a dog. Luis had gone through two operations for a serious high blood pressure problem, and he couldn't always play with Jonathan as much as they would like. I used to feel like a bit lonely sometimes, and I wanted a companion to be always with, but my dad didn't want a dog, and I was thinking I'm probably never gonna get a dog, and sometimes I cried because of that. Luis could not be convinced. He didn't want his son to go through the pain of losing a pet. But sometimes a child's wishes can come true. When Jonathan's mother, Olivia, learned of a cocker spaniel named Prince who needed a new home, she decided to take a chance and fulfill Jonathan's wish. I was happy. I was finally getting a companion I've always wanted. We don't know how that is going to react about the dog, so I want you to be prepared for that, all right? I'll try. When he got home, Luis was furious. What's this? When I come back, I saw a little prince inside the house, and I said, uh, whose dog is that? My first thought was that, um, you know, he was going to say, get this dog out of here. I don't want no dog here. And then my mom explained to him, and he's like, oh, no, we're not keeping a dog. All Luis had wanted was to protect his son from the pain he himself knew all too well. But it was already too late. But since, since I see that Jonathan was in love with this uh, little dog, Prince, I said, what am I going to do? Just keep it. I'll let him stay in my house. The dog stayed, but Luis wasn't happy about it. Prince realized he had to work on that. I get up early in the morning. And I noticed that uh, he wants to go out. Alone with Prince in the early morning, Luis soon realized he couldn't say no when Prince was begging to go out. Okay, you win. He wouldn't admit it, but the little dog was growing on him. I knew if, um, if my dad didn't love Prince, he wouldn't be taking him out on walks before I woke up. My dad started to pet him and everything and call him, play around with him. And that's how I knew he started to love Prince. Then, one day in October of last year, the little dog did something that would secure his place in the family forever. I get up early in the morning around five o'clock. I drink a coffee before I go out. I was fine when I started walking my dog. They hadn't walked far when Luis went to cross a busy street. Before that, I was uh, happy just talking to Prince, you know, I walked. I said, let's go. I saw a car coming from maybe 25 feet away. And I said, I have to get across the street. And I went up. That's the last thing I remember. Luis had passed out in the middle of a busy New York street. Prince tried to wake him as cars swerved around them. Then Prince started to pull. What uh, makes me wake up was that uh, 
spring was pulling me up, pulling me up. And I said, oh my God, where am I? He was trying to pull me out of the way. Prince was frantic in his efforts. He was too small a dog to move Luis, but he wouldn't give up. Any second could be Luis's last. He was trying so hard. Being such a little thing, he was trying to pull me out of the way. Luis struggled to his feet, but his head was pounding and his thoughts confused. After that, I get up. I realized that I pass out. For a few seconds, I said, how that happened? I was fine. With Prince's constant encouragement, Louise stumbled to the safety of the sidewalk. I was kind of uh, being mad, just to be laying on the street. And the poor dog trying to get me out of in front of the car. Then, just as they got there, Luis realized he was missing a shoe. In his confusion, he turned back into traffic to get it. And Prince pulled him out of the street a second time. A lady driving the car in front of me asked me, are you all right? I'm okay, I said, yes, I'm all right. I kept walking across the street. As Luis headed home, he began to realize what Prince had done. And I kept talking to him, like saying, you know, thank you for staying with me. Luis made a full recovery, and there is one thing he knows for sure, he was glad that Prince was there. I still think that without him being with me that day, probably they ran me over, or uh, I don't know, anything could happen. I was saying to myself, what happened? I just drink a coffee before I get out of my house and I start walking. I don't even know what happened to me, it just went down without any reason. I think if um, Prince was not with my dad, I think the car would have hit him and killed him. That's what I think would have happened. Now, Luis realizes his mistake. Caring for a dog is not about what one might someday lose, but about the love that one gains every day. I think we can't be without the prince in the house. He protects uh, the house, everybody loves, loves him. I don't think we can be without his uh, beautiful dog. He's like my brother. And um, I would do anything for him because um, he's like my family's guardian angel. I love you, and you know that. Coming up, Barney runs away to find the happy family he lost. But how can he find something that's not there? It will take a miracle. Did you ever feel alone and lost in a big world? Well, that's how the little dog in our next story must have felt when he became lost in a place he'd never been before. It's a miracle where he ended up. Christine Fontaine and her dog Barney are inseparable. They even watch TV together. Barney's favorites are animal shows. Barney grew up in Victoria, Canada, with lots of brothers and sisters, a mother and father, and a home filled with love. When he was only two, they moved to the country 20 miles up the coast. It was paradise for the little dog. But eight years later, they suffered a terrible loss. Christine's husband died unexpectedly, and everything changed. Attempting a fresh start, Christine and Barney moved away. I decided to take Barney with me because he's my everything. The other dogs went with Christine's 27-year-old son, so Christine and Barney were suddenly alone. After settling into a small bungalow, 
Christine went to work, leaving Barney by himself for the first time. It was a typical day. I had decided that morning that I was going to leave Barney at home. So I had gone out the back and reinforced the back porch area to make sure that there was no way for him to get out. Barney would never leave, and especially if he knew that I was coming back. But Barney shared Christine's grief. Feeling alone and abandoned in a strange place, Barney somehow made his escape. He needed to search for the happy times they had left behind. So he began his journey. He wasn't sure where and he wasn't sure how, but he would follow his heart, a small dog in a very big world. Barney soon arrived at the ocean. He now realized the enormity of the task ahead. Driven by instinct and longing, the tiny dog ventured on. He had no map, nothing familiar to guide him, but a powerful longing drew him onward. But the obstacles seemed to grow ever larger. Now he needed to get across the channel. Even the rocks stood in his way. He thought what he was looking for was on the other side. He had to find the way across. Then a heavy rain began. Cold and miserable, the little dog pressed on. Far from finding the happiness he sought, he emerged into a world of huge monsters and chaos. Barney wanted to give up, but something kept calling. Where was Barney going? And would he find what he was looking for? We'll be right back with the conclusion of Barney's incredible journey. Animal Miracles will continue. After losing her husband, Christine's life fell apart. She took her dog, Barney, and moved to a new house. Then, when she went to work, Barney thought he had lost everything. That's when he began his amazing journey to find the happiness they had left behind. But this was the most perilous part of all. He had to cross a huge and busy intersection. Peter Hedge, a local college instructor, pulled up just before Barney started across. I saw this little black dog in the middle of one of the few busy intersections that we have in Victoria. And the dog was obviously distressed. His ears were back. He was glancing furtively all around. His tail was between his legs. And I guess my heart just went out to him. But before Peter could catch him, Barney charged through the traffic. Now Barney knew he was getting close. So I overtook the little dog and parked outside of an apartment complex. It was obvious to me that he now knew exactly where it was he was going because he was quite perky. With Peter in hot pursuit, Barney ducked under a fence and disappeared. I followed him into the car park, but I'd lost him. As soon as I got in there, he was gone. I figured that was it, I'd lost him. Now Barney could smell it. He was almost there. At last, this was where he was headed all along. Barney called and called, but no one answered. All Barney had wanted was to go home to the life he missed so much, but now he realized it wasn't here. A few minutes later, as Peter continued on his way, they crossed paths again. And there, in the distance, I saw him again. I guess he'd slipped through some gardens or something. Come on, that little guy. 
Come on, it's all over. We've got you. Let's go and To his amazement, the little dog allowed Peter to pick him up. He knew he must belong to someone. The dog was incredibly cute. He was just adorable. So I took him to the nearest vet clinic. Meanwhile, miles away, Christine had arrived home. She knew immediately something was wrong. Whenever I've come home before, I always hear Barney barking. And um, as soon as I got out of my car, I didn't hear him. No Barney. I came in the house and called him, and he wasn't here. Barney? Barney Boo? I couldn't believe that he was gone. Um, I was heart sick. This dog was sort of the last big thing that I had in my life, and uh, I just felt terrible that he, was, he wasn't there. Barney felt even worse. How could he have gone through so much, only to end up here? Frantic. Christine called the SPCA. My name is Christine Fontaine, and I'm just phoning to report that I've lost a very small dog today, and I was wondering if anybody had turned him in. But Barney wasn't there. All right, thank you. So I waited all night with virtually no sleep, absolutely sick with worry. Late the next afternoon, the SPCA finally had a lead. They told Christine about a tiny dog found miles away. Barney had just about given up hope until he heard a familiar voice and his spirit soared. Yeah, that's so yes. exciting. Hi, Barney. Barney. That's so great. <laughs> Hello, Barney. Yes, I know. I missed you too. Hello. <laughs> yes. But the most amazing thing about Barney's adventure was about to be revealed. Christine phoned me and thanked me profusely for finding her dog. And as it had such a happy ending, I thought I would tell her exactly what transpired. So I went through with a blow-by-blow -blow account of what I had seen of Barney's incredible journey. While Peter told his story, Christine was getting goosebumps as she realized Barney's true destination. I said to Peter, oh my stars, um, I used to live at 510 Goldstream Avenue. It was a white house with, with blue trim. It was Barney's first home. He had spent only two years there, more than eight years ago. I was amazed, completely amazed, that Barney found his way there because he had never traveled. I know what he was looking for was his family. He wanted everybody to be back together again. Now Barney realized that home is where the love is. What he was looking for all along was right here with Christine. I absolutely love that dog. Barney is my absolute everything. I know he means as much to me as I mean to him. He is, he is uh, the light of my life. Up next, a kid repeatedly runs away from foster homes and gets sent upstate to where the counselors are in a barn. I looked at myself back then and I look now, it's like, wow. Most of us have become increasingly removed from nature. We live in cities, we ride on subways, and with the hectic pace of the modern world, we find it impossible to get out and get close to animals of any kind. More and more, teachers, scientists, social workers are discovering that by reconnecting with the natural world, we can reconnect with our own humanity. For those facing adversity in their lives, this connection can mean the difference between life and death. Back in the early 1990s, Harold was running away, yet again. Since the age of two, he had been a ward of the state, placed in foster care. As he grew older, he got into almost daily fights and wouldn't stay in school. I got just kept moving from the home to home. It was, it was hard, it was hard. It was difficult for me. I was running away. But no matter how far he ran, Harold could never leave his troubles behind. He just didn't know how to connect with other people, and so he pushed away everyone who tried to help. I was defiant. I was kind of a, leave me out, you can't tell me nothing, kid. Nobody knew what to do with him. As a last resort, social services sent the young boy to Green Chimneys, a special home in upstate New York for children at risk. Here, some of the best therapists are in the barnyard. 
Paul Kupchak is the director of the Green Chimneys Farm and Wildlife Center. Harold was a very, very troubled child when he first came here. We've been given the opportunity to read his case history and, and to understand some of the horrible things that happened to him. And in Harold's face, you could see the pain. Well, I didn't want to be it. I didn't really know anybody. It was just hard. Uh, and I didn't really interact with people well. I would be in trouble because you know, I was a little cocky and I had an attitude. Paul could tell Harold really needed help. He wasn't really interested in interacting with any of the children that lived here, with any of the staff that lived here. I think it was a little gun shy of people. Green Chimneys has served as both home and school for many troubled kids. The staff hopes that they might learn to connect with animals in ways that they never connected with people. I think it's offering these kids an opportunity to trust the animals, offering these kids an opportunity to feel loved and to feel like they can love. A lot of these children, unfortunately, were never nurtured before coming here and just don't know what giving nurture and being nurtured feels like. The first thing the children learn when they come here is that they have something in common with the animals. A lot of the animals have come here very similar to the way that the children come here. Very often the animals have been abandoned, they've been unwanted, they've uh, been in situations where their lives were, were terribly distressed. While the children are healing the animals, the animals are healing the children. I like the colors. Inevitably, these kids grow attached to the animals that need them so much. That makes it a little easier to take the next step to connect with the counselors on the Green Chimney's staff. You can't solve problems unless the kids are willing to talk about the problems. And we think that the animals have the key to opening those doors. Shortly after Harold arrived at Green Chimney's, he met Laddie. Harold had never seen a real horse. He actually nudged his head against me. He's like, you know, wow, I'm touching a horse. That was cool. This caught Harold's interest, and Paul convinced him to sign on as one of Laddie's caregivers. Harold would have to feed, groom, and ride Laddie on a regular basis. When I first started working with animals, I was a little scared, but then, you know, it took a little getting used to. But Laddie wanted Harold's attention and love. Before long, he got it. He became a friend, actually. Something to look forward to, because I always was with him, so. I felt comfortable with him. Then, Harold began to change. After being around Laddie and a lot of the other farm animals, you saw a face that was full of that pain and a face that was always tense become a much more relaxed face. You saw eyes that were almost frozen become eyes that were able to look far beyond the things that had bothered him before. As Harold and the other kids grew up, the animals worked their miracles. It was a big change for me. Working with the animals, you know, made me more caring and more gentle and I was a more sociable person. I was easy going. I made friends easy. Harold's confidence grew and now he wanted to put his skills to use with other animals. Harold signed up to learn how to train service dogs. You're having a hard time just Nose. Flip, flip her, her, her nose yeah. and then give her a treat for doing a task. These dogs will assist those confined to wheelchairs or in need of physical help. See Dixie? Dixie was one of the dogs assigned to Harold. Animal has to trust you first. You have a lot of treats and you pet them a lot, spend a lot of time. You give them love and you show them that it was a good job. Finally, after nine months and hundreds of hours of training, Dixie graduated. It was time to apply the 80 commands Harold had taught her to help her new companion, Debbie. Say bye to Harold. See you, Dixie. Say bye to Harold. Right. They come in nervous and they go back home nervous. Not long after that, it was time for Harold to say goodbye to Green Chimneys, to take his next step and move out on his own. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look. These uh, wings look like they can fly, don't they? She had a broken wing when she came here. All right, okay. 
You want to just maybe just go one, two, three and give her a nice high pitch and we'll wish her good luck? All right. Okay. You got it, Hal. One, two, three. How do you feel? Feel good. Makes me feel good. Let a bird free home. Now Harold knows he can make it on his own by making friends, by working hard, and by trusting and being worthy of the trust of others. I looked at myself now, and I look back then, it's like, wow, that was me back then, you know, it's different, it's a big change. It's amazing to me that I've seen uh, so many children come to Green Chimneys that um, had lost trust in human beings, but were able to rekindle that trust through animals. When you see a child like Harold um, become a, a, a wonderful, mature, young adult, it makes us all feel wonderful. It gives us hope. Next, when Christina slips on ice and is knocked unconscious. I knew I was going down. There was no stopping it. I just remember fear. It was an ungodly fear. The little dog she rescued becomes her only home. Perhaps the most precious miracles of all are the ones that are neither asked for nor expected. In our next story, a woman from a small Pennsylvania town owes everything to the larger-than-life heroics of her very special dog. Percy's days were numbered. No one wanted to adopt the little dog. He was old and he had recently lost a leg. If a new owner wasn't found soon, the animal shelter would have to put Percy down. But then Christina Lohman came to the shelter. She was looking for a dog to keep her company at her rural home in Pennsylvania. I was told uh, that Percy was in a car wreck and that his owners were killed outright. And they found Percy and they had to amputate the leg and they sewed his tail back on. When she saw the injured dog, she knew she couldn't leave him. You can't not look at that dog without loving that dog. And he has soul in his eyes. The bond was immediately for me and Percy. Christina was happy to have such an adorable dog, but Percy would need a lot of special attention. When first Percy came to me, he was um, shy. He didn't run. He didn't even bark. He cowered. I'm sure he was full of pain. But Christina put her heart and soul into helping the little dog recuperate she even built a ramp up to her bed so he could sleep with her every night. Percy's recovery was slow but steady, and Christina never stopped encouraging him. You know that it's going to be okay. This dog will love you. Never knowing that not long after, he saved would save my life. It was Christmas Day, and Christina was looking forward to dinner later that evening with her best friend, Dolores Nesbitt. But before she got all dressed up, she decided to clean the ashes out of her wood stove. She took the ashes outside to spread on the walkway. It helped give traction on the ice and snow. I wasn't tired for being outside that morning, but it was just going to be a quick trip out. I didn't plan on what happened. Suddenly, Christina lost her footing. I was falling. I knew I was going down. I remember that rush, and there was no stopping it. I just remember fear. It was an ungodly fear. Christina was knocked unconscious, and it was well below freezing. She quickly began to lose vital body heat. Her friend wasn't expecting her for four hours. By then, Christina would be dead. Percy knew she was in trouble. He tried to wake her up, but nothing worked. Two hours passed. Hypothermia had set in, and in the numbing cold, Christina's body was shutting down to conserve warmth. Finally, Percy's persistence paid off. She started to come around. He was draped across my stomach, because I remember feeling that heaviness in my chest. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know why I was there. But I had this dog, and he kept jumping on me and licking my face and jumping on me. And I'm thinking, Percy, quit it. What's wrong with you? Then it dawned on me that I had fallen. 
Slowly, Percy's prodding made her realize what she had to do. My hands were numb. I couldn't feel my legs, I was so cold. I remember feeling real breathless. And in my head, it felt like Niagara Falls was in there. It, the roaring, the awful roaring. Christina struggled toward the house, but she was numb with cold and couldn't make it. I think in that flash of the moment, nobody's gonna find me is what I thought. I just remember total fear. I thought I'm gonna die here. But Percy wouldn't let Christina give up. I was fighting with the wanting to sleep. Percy in his persistence, with his barking and his, you know, running at me and licking my face. That's what kept me awake. It was like the whole world had stopped and there was just two items in it, you and the dog. I had this urgency in me. I had to get to the phone. I had to get help. Christina made it to the kitchen, but she couldn't stand up to reach the phone. It was such a helpless feeling because you've come all this way and now, now there's one more thing you gotta do. And the cord was there and I just pulled the cord and the phone come down. And you know, I'm sitting there with the phone, or laying there with the phone, and I couldn't remember any numbers, and it was the most helpless feeling I ever had in my life. So I was reaching for zero for the operator, and I must have hit Rita. Hello? Uh, help. It connected Christina, you, Christina to the last person she had talked to, Hello? her neighbor, Dolores. Christina? Now, she didn't say her name, but I knew from her voice who it was. I was scared because I thought that she had taken a heart attack. She possibly wasn't even alive when I'd get there. Hang up now. This is a oh my gosh, Christina. Hang up. Christina. I was really scared because she wasn't moving Christina. and you couldn't see her breathing. Christina. So I was, I was, you know, oh almost gosh. afraid to walk over to her. Not real close to her to see if she was breathing first. And she was, but she was breathing very shallow. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, you're breathing. Oh great. Dolores great. called 911. Percy laid down beside her and wouldn't move. Dolores prayed it wasn't too late for her best friend. Yes, I need an ambulance right away. My friend is unconscious. I was really scared because I was getting no response whatsoever. And I was to the point of tears. She's breathing now. She's awake. Dolores was relieved to see a hopeful sign. Christina began to speak. The first words Christina said was, I fell. And then her next words were, where's Percy? Everything's going to be OK, Christina. <gasps> Percy. Fortunately, Christina recovered quickly. Oh, look at you, sweetheart. But the doctors oh, told her too. if Percy had not awakened her when he did, she would never have woken up at all. By the end of Christmas Day, she was back in her own bed, reunited with her little hero. Mm -hmm. It was a Christmas that none of them would ever forget. That made my Christmas day. She saved his life by taking him from the pound, but in turn, he saved her life, which is really amazing. I mean, it must have been that he was meant to be with Chris. Like, God was watching over Chris, and he sent this dog down to protect her, so he did. I think he knew in his little heart that he had to save me on Christmas Day. You couldn't be given any greater gift than the gift of life. Did you get a run for Mom? <laughs> Did you get a run? So many of these stories show us the endless capacity of animals to return the love we give them, and usually even more. Be good to the animals around you. You never know what miracles they might bring to your life. I'm Alan Thick, and we'll see you next time. Wait for